All right, we are also now streaming live on Facebook. So if you know anyone who, you know, might not have registered, but might be able to watch it on Facebook, please let them know as well. All right, I'd like to invite Nova, one of our interpreters, to start with the instructions. Okay. Uh, hello, teman-teman di Indonesia. Hello, teman-teman dari Indonesia. Untuk mengakses uh, penerjemahan, kawan-kawan silakan lihat pada layar bagian bawah ada lambang dunia atau interpretation ya. Lalu klik interpretation. Di situ ada tiga bahasa. Silakan kawan-kawan untuk memilih bahasa. Ya, kalau kawan-kawan sedang mendengarkan bahasa yang bahasa Spanyol dan Inggris masih masih terdengar akan mengganggu, silakan teman-teman untuk unmute original audio. Bila teman-teman masih kesulitan mengakses bahasa, silakan lihat petunjuk di grup WA atau WA saya. Terima kasih. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nova. Um, I would now like to invite Chus, another one of our interpreters. Yo te escucho, eh, ella escucha en español, ¿eh? En la, pan en la pantalla. Si sí, yo he hecho el link en, en el español, porque como estaba hablando en inglés nada más, puse español y estoy escuchando perfectamente. Okay, I think Chus has given instructions already. Um, so, um, thank you. Uh, may I, thank you, thank you, Chus. Um, May I ask um, the tech team to uh, share our community guidelines? Okay, so thank you very much. Um, so hello everyone. My name is Sharmila. I am working with GATW. Um, I am, my pronouns are she or her. Uh, on behalf of GATW, we are very honored, excited, and really thrilled to be part of these conversations, uh, which feature per feminist perspectives on, on labor migration. This is the second in a series of six. So in a little bit, I'm going to be posting on the chat the recording for the first session that you can watch after this one if you missed that. Um, now, our my co-moderator today is uh, Lucilla, who is the CEO of Focus on Labor Exploitation. And Lucilla will be introducing this session in a bit more depth and also introducing the panelists. But before that, just some you know, housekeeping reminders for everyone. So you see the community guidelines on the screen. Um, I request everyone to please read this and please um, you know, familiarize yourselves with it. Second, um, encourage you to keep introducing yourselves on the chat. It's lovely to, to see people and hear where you're from, as I said. Third, uh, you may post your questions to the panelists at any point on the Q&A channel. We will answer them at the end of the, uh, towards the later end of the session, but please post them anytime and then we will just be tracking them. If you have a specific question for a specific panelist, please indicate their name there as well. Um, finally, uh, you know, we are all 
doing this online. We're all figuring out the internet. Not all of us have the same, you know, good access to the internet. So we will have some issues. That's normal. That happens. You know, someone might lose their internet connection. Someone might not be sure what to do next. If this happens, please don't worry. Don't panic. Um, we have tech support. So uh, Bobby from GATW will be doing tech support for us. If you need any tech assistance, please just send a direct message. Um, you'll find them on the list of participants. And obviously we're here to help. So don't worry about that. That's expected, right? So welcome again, everyone. It's really exciting to see you here. I will now turn over to Lucilla. Hello, hello everyone and welcome. Uh, my name is Lucila Ranada, as Jamila mentioned. I am a migrant woman from Argentina, living in the UK. Um, I'm, a, I'm the chief executive of an organization called Focus on Labor Exploitation, or FLEX for short. We are a, an NGO that is based in, in the UK and we're dedicated to end labor exploitation. We have a strong focus on prevention and consider the enforcement of workers' full rights as a key element for the prevention of more severe forms of exploitation. Um, and so as an organization, we are dedicated to do research, policy, strategic comms work, and we also work with partners at the front line to do joint advocacy work. Um, I'm also a GATW member, and uh, the connection comes also because Flex is a member of the GATW's network. And so, um, as Sharmila mentioned, we, we've been working with GATW and with our uh, partners in this series of, of seminars or, or webinars. Um, and I'll be chairing a, a really great panel uh, today. But before we get into the topic of the day, I wanted to uh, give you a bit of context of the series that we're working, uh, that we're doing, uh, and that we're, this uh, session joins. Um, and so Feminist Fridays is a series of six online meetings that happened every third uh, Friday at 1 p.m. GMT, so uh, GMT time, same time as, as today. And these series are a series of conversations, really, about labor migration. And we are looking at what an intersectional lens or an intersectional feminist lens to labor migration means and how it, it can be implemented and how we can help in uh, developing or building uh, feminist knowledge on labor migration. So I'm hoping that everybody has accessed a background note um, that, that explains, that further explains kind of the rationale of these sessions. But uh, as a reminder, these are our guiding questions. How can we stand in solidarity with migrant workers, work with states and non-state actors for the realization of their rights? And how can we critique the economic and development paradigms that uh, increase precarious migration, that drive precarious migration? How can we celebrate the agency and the strengths of migrant workers while also highlighting the abuse and exploitation that they face? So at the last session, which uh, was also um, the, the opening session of the series, we focused on exploring the question, what exactly do we mean by feminist approach to labor migration? It would be very difficult, if not impossible, to summarize the whole discussion from the first uh, session. And so I will recommend, as Ramila did, to, uh, to watch the recording. It was a really interesting session about the history and the meaning of intersectionality and a feminist approach to labor migration. But to give you a glance of the discussion and to kind of contextualize the, converse, contextualize the conversation that we're going to have, I will uh, borrow a phrase from one of the speakers, uh, Dr. Tania Bastia from the University of Manchester. She introduced feminist, a feminist approach to labor migration as a recognition that gender relations and gender inequalities are always also classed and racialized. Uh, racialized. We can't talk about gender inequalities in any context without recognizing that these inequalities are embedded in societies and economies that are also deeply racialized and organized according to class, ethnicity, and other systems of disadvantage. So looking at labor migration from an intersectional feminist lens understands workers' struggles in their own complex context. Acknowledging that labor migration and the experiences of women workers and marginalized minoritized workers are shaped by different forms of inequalities, such as gender and racial inequalities. 
So as a series, uh, we are interested in as organizations, we're interested in building feminist knowledge on labor migration. And today's uh, session is focused on feminist participatory action research. We have a fantastic panel that will share with us their views and experiences during FPAR, or Feminist Participatory Action Research, uh, with migrant workers. But before I uh, introduce the panel, uh, I wanted to have a quick view over these terms. So we are talking, we're going to speak about Feminist Participatory Action Research, or FPAR for short, but what do we mean by that? And what is FPAR or, or PAR in the first place? And how can it be feminist? So PAR, or participatory action research, is a research approach where the experiences and knowledge and perspectives of the group or the community that is being researched are not just taken into account, but they also become the foundation of the research. So it's doing research with rather than on or for a group. And it recognizes that workers themselves have important insights about the issues that they face, the contributing factors that drive those issues, and also possible solutions through direct experience. So we're of course experts of our own experience and as such workers, workers' knowledge can help, um, or in fact, say it's necessary, you could argue that it's indispensable to define the boundaries of a problem, identify and shape better policy solutions. So the action, the term action in PAR, the A in PAR, is a key word that we don't want to lose sight, lose sight of today. It means that by adopting this approach, we're not just talking about community involvement in the production of knowledge, but also about collectively improving a situation and using that knowledge to take actions and seek change. And so what about the F? How, how can PAR be, be feminist or what is a feminist approach to PAR? Um, so FPAR, of course, is research for social change. It aims to enable the participation and activism of those uh, that are affected by an issue with the purpose of liberation of oppressed or silent groups. It challenges the neutrality of research and the idea that research, the topics, the questions, the methods, or how you use those methods, how you interpret those, those findings, can be objective. Um, and so in doing that, it challenges the established working re uh, power relationships in research and in society. So by doing FBAR, we also aim to highlight and challenge intersecting forms of oppression. And so its focus is on the experiences of women or other minoritized or other groups. And uh, so for instance, when looking at labor, labor abuse, an FBAR approach will look, will, will seek to, to uh, place the experiences, the voices, and the interests of the women workers or the minorities group of workers that we're uh, working with at the center. And by doing so, it will look at these issues by taking into account the different forms of oppressions that these groups are constantly resisting. Uh, so looking at gender inequality, racial discrimination, and so on alongside labor relations. So this is the focus of today's session. We will look at how we can build feminist uh, knowledge on labor migration by adopting an FBAR approach, and we will explore the implications of doing research in this way. We will learn from panelists that have conducted FBAR in very diverse contexts, and I don't want to uh, use more of the time that we have today, so I will move quickly on to our panel. But I wanted to first mention also that we recognize that uh, many of you in uh, listening to this uh, podcast or webinar will probably have experience doing FBAR and could very easily be speaking here today. Um, or perhaps you are interested in uh, joining further discussions about FBAR, learning more about this approach, uh, sharing knowledge. And so we will share a brief survey after the session for you to input your details if you're interested in, in being contacted later on uh, in relation to this, this conversation. So yes, let's move on to our panel. Uh, we're going to uh, get to know our panelists first. Um, a general reminder about comments. Uh, please do post comments on the chat box and questions on the Q&A box so that uh, we can easily spot your questions. You're all encouraged to send your questions as you, as you think about them. 
We will have a Q&A at the end, uh, and we're going to start with uh, some questions to the panelists from me. Uh, panelists, I also want to remind you that you can answer those questions in the Q&A box, uh, especially if they're very specific about your, your work. Um, please go ahead and, and, and feel free to respond to those directly. So let's start with our first uh, panelist. We first have Kai Mei Lau from the Asian, uh, Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development, or APWLD. Um, Kamei Lau is a program officer of the migration program uh, of APWLD, which is a feminist membership driven network committed to women human rights and the development of justice through feminist movements and solidarity powers across the region. Before she joined APWLD, Kaimei was organizer secretary of the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions where she organized with migrant women and lo local domestic workers in Hong Kong. Good evening, I believe, if you're in Hong Kong. Good evening, uh, Kaimei. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. My first question to you is, could you please tell us a bit more about the purpose of the network, where are you based, and who your members are? Yeah, hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Lucilla, for your wonderful introductions to set the contest for today's discussion. Uh, I'm Kemi. My organization is Asia Pacific Forum on Women Law and Development, APWD. We are we based in Chiang Mai, Thailand, and with a satellite office in Malaysia, Penang. We are a membership driven network of feminist organizations and individual activists in Asia and the Pacific, with 252 members from 27 countries in the region. We have various programs with different focuses, including building the capacity of the most marginalized indigenous migrants, women workers, and women in poverty on their rights over land and resources, decent work, peace and security, and strengthen grassroots women's political leaderships and participations and in decision-making processes. We also advocate to ensure international and regional laws and standards to reflect women's human rights and grassroots voices. And by monitoring the sustainable development goals by using the feminist development justice framework to increase the power of uh, feminist movement. And since 2012, APWD has used FBAR as a core method to support women's movement and to advance women's human rights on, on the ground. We have um, FBAR with different thematic focuses, including land rights, peace, climate justice, labor migrations, trade agreement and marginalized community to build up the knowledge from the ground. So I'm very excited to join the discussion today to share and learn from all your experience on the FR experiences. Thanks very much. And we look forward to hearing more about your experience and the experience of your network. Um, I know, for instance, that you're coordinating a, an FR project uh, on labor migration that involves seven uh, different partners. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to invite you to tell us a bit more about that project to give, a, give us a glance of what you're doing. Uh, what inspired you to do FBART and why did your organization decide to do um, feminist participatory action research? What was the motivation? Yeah, sure. Our migration FBART started in 2019. We collaborated with seven partners organizations in six different countries in Nepal, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Hong Kong and Kyrgyzstan who work with uh, migration issues with different research topics and objectives. We have organizations focus on the rights of domestic workers to explore the working conditions and human rights violations of migrant domestic workers in Malaysia with the context that the domestic workers are being excluded from the existing labor law protections. And through FPAR, they organize the migrant domestic workers to advocate for a new separate legal protections for the domestic workers. And we also have FPAR partners in Nepal to collect the evidence on the impact of travel ban for Nepali women to work abroad to show that the ban imposed on the Nepali imposed by the Nepali government actually is not protecting the migrant women from being exploited in the foreign countries, but to push them to use irregular and dangerous channel to migrate. And even worse, sometimes they become the target of human trafficking uh, syndicates. So all these case study and testimony of the human trafficking victims become a very strong 
evidence and advocacy resources to demand for the abolish of the travel ban. And um, we also have FPA partner in India to research on the health and working condition of migrant sex workers in India, especially after the pandemic outbreak, the um, migrant sex workers lost their income and also they are being excluded in all these national welfare schemes and um, the health services. So our partners in India asked for Barifa to show how to use FR to show how migrant sex workers are being discriminated and lost the access to health services and they demand for more universal coverage of health services and welfare for the migrant sex workers. So as you can see um, from this, all these examples, these topics, they are very action oriented with a very specific advocacy goals or direction to tie with the research topic. And this is also, this explains why we do FPAR. Our principal purpose of doing FPAR is to change the system and the structures to improve the lives of the marginalized women. And we see change is the structural change to change the system of the oppressions. So um, to create or to, 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 to create all these structural changes, we use the framework called the theory of change to do the planning and evaluation to guide, to guide us throughout the whole FPAR processes. So in simply the changes area we identified have four main elements, including first, develop capacity and skills of the community. Second, to build up to produce the knowledge, data, tools, and resources for the women's movement. Third is to create the advocacy space to change laws, policies, and practice. And fourth is creating the movement and collective pressure for the structural change. So in the past two years, we have seen that our partners have successfully documented stories to reflect the lived experience on the ground. And also we have seen changes happen in the process. It is also reflected in the, in the data collection uh, stage. Uh, we use focus group discussions and questionnaire, but we also use some activities to collect data, such as one example is um, one exercise we call body mapping to do it together with the women to unpack the concept of gender and discuss their gender roles and gender stereotyping and how all these gender norms in the society influence their lives. So from this kind of activities, women workers in the community are more easy to share and go into the discussions. And more importantly, the data collection process at the same time is also a process to build the capacity of the women to link their own life experience to the system, uh, system issues, to the systemic issues. And another example is our partner in Indonesia, Kababumi. They work on the issues of document confiscation by the employment agency. So they use their hotline and center to receive cases and provide information and support to those workers. From there, they have collected data on the experience of on their experience of how their documents are confiscated, but also they work together with all these people who come to seek help. Some of them even uh, join their organizations and to become part of the research. So you can see the transformation happen here. They are from come, uh, come to the center as a victim and they transform, transform to become a researcher, to become part of the change agent in the process. So that's some of our experience in our migration app part. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. It's a uh, very impressive work that you're doing across very different uh, contexts and with uh, some of the most invisibilized uh, groups. So thank you very much for all the work that you're doing and for that intro to, to us. Um, you have, you know, there are very clear systemic changes that your research is, is um, seeking, but also uh, your your uh, introduction also reflected that that uh, how powerful that that kind of self empowering journey can be uh, for for the women involved. So um, fantastic to to learn more about that, and we will have the chance to to talk about some of the of your work in more more detail. Um, so we're going to move on quickly to the second panelist, um, and somebody I know very well because she's my colleague at Flex. 
Uh, her name is Mary Alberg. She's a research manager at Focus on Labor Exploitation, or FLEX. Uh, Mary leads our policy-oriented research with a focus on the system, structures, and policies that create in increased risk of exploitation for workers. Her current projects include feminist participatory action research with women and young migrant workers in cleaning, hospitality, and the app-based delivery sector, and studying the impact of immigration status on migrant workers, access to employment rights, and social protections in the context of COVID-19. Before joining FLEX, Mary worked as a consultant at the ILO Southeast Asia. So Mary, I've already introduced FLEX, um, but to give everybody a bit of context, can you please tell us more about the FLEX research why we do research, uh, a little bit about the current priorities. And welcome. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here, and I feel like already from that first uh, discussion, I've learned a lot of things um, that I'm kind of excited to apply also to our research. Um, I'm going to just talk quickly about our research, like Lucilla said, and, and why we're doing it. Um, we specifically do policy-oriented research, so research for policy advocacy and to drive social change at the policy level. So our main focus is the government and trying to change mainly government policy. Um, and our starting point for research is often kind of what are the problems or policy areas that need to be addressed? And then from that, what are the kind of evidence gaps that we need to fill in order to, to address those problems and influence effectively around that? Um, and that means that a lot of our research is responding to the kind of current policy agenda, which if you're based in Europe, you will be sick of hearing about this topic, but Brexit has been a really big one. So the UK leaving the European Union and what that means in terms of immigration policy. So the fact that there will no longer be regular routes of immigration into low paid work, for instance. Um, so the, rise, the likely rise of irregularity is a con consequence of that. Um, but also the introduction of more restrictive short-term um, immigration programs and what the risks associated with that are. Um, the other kind of current area of policy, like Priscilla already mentioned, is COVID-19. So we're looking at migrant workers' access to social protections and employment rights, and what are the links between lack of access to social protection and risk of exploitation. Um, and what we're seeing is that COVID is really magnifying a lot of existing issues and we're using this research to kind of document that and so that we can use it to respond to the current crisis, but also when after COVID to influence the issues that are structural and long term and that we know we're there already. Um, then there's also kind of another approach, which is that we kind of a bit more bottom up, so not just looking at the policy issues, but focusing on high risk sectors and high groups that are facing multiple or intersecting risks or vulnerabilities um, and doing research with them or in those sectors to understand what are the issues, what are the risks, what are the resilience factors and what are the changes that are needed so that we can try to get those onto the policy agenda. I think hopefully that summarizes kind of what we do. Yes, that's... Uh really clear. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, can you please then uh, share a bit about our current FBAR project? That is um, something you will refer to uh, today. And then also, um, same question as before uh, to Kaimei, what inspired you to do FBAR? Why did we decide to do um, feminist participatory action research? Yeah, so this is a, a new uh, research approach for us um, and it's something we started well new is relative but we started about two uh, and a bit years ago uh, piloting this research approach in three sectors that are considered high risk in the UK uh, which is cleaning hospitality and the kind of app-based courier sector in the gig economy um, and we're working specifically with women and young EU uh, nationals, and that is, was again influenced by the policy context of Brexit, which is why we were focusing on EU nationals. Um, and the way that we've approached FPAR is to essentially try to involve workers from those sectors in every stage of the research. So making sure that workers um, influence the design, they have a say in the kind of questions we ask, how we ask them, what methods we're using, 
Um, they are actually doing the data collection together with us. So doing peer-to-peer -peer interviews, uh, facilitating focus groups with their peers, um, designing within those focus groups as well and through conversations, um, what should be the policy intervention, what, what are the recommendations that come from, from the findings that we have, and then working kind of individually and together with us and each other to try to advocate for change. Um, and we've been working, it's, we've been working with multiple nationalities and migrants from a lot of different countries, mainly from Latin America and kind of recent EU migrants. So people who have recently migrated from Romania or Poland. Um, and then we've also, as part of that project, we're doing some quantitative data collection as well. Um, and doing that also in multiple languages. <clears throat> um, and so far we've published some of our research. So for instance, we have a working paper on cleaning um, and a handbook on kind of our experiences of doing FPAR so far, because we very much approached it as a learning process and we want to document that, that process as well. Um, in terms of the inspiration that we've had, I think Flex is very much based on and started from the idea that policy should be shaped by those with lived experience. And that's, for instance, we work with a lot of frontline organizations. We're not a frontline organization ourselves, but we want to make sure that we're kind of reflecting what's happening actually on the ground and doing a lot of partnership work to do that. Um, but then we wanted to also do that within our research. So to make sure that we're enabling and, and supporting workers to participate in research because they have important insights through experience about the causes and drivers of labor exploitation and what some of the solutions might be. Um, and that they should have an impact and a say on, on policy because they're the ones most affected by it as well. Um, I think there's also a goal to kind of democratize and demystify research so that people it's more accessible for people. So it's not something that's just done by kind of elite institutions or researchers in a very in a formal way um, and then kind of saw it as a way also as um, increasing people's voice and representation in policy. Um, in terms of, I also had kind of my own inspiration. There was the question when it was shared, there was kind of an option of your own and the organizations. And for me, I've always been interested in doing feminist research and research for social change, but I've also found the research can be a really transformative and, and interesting experience it can be really energizing, it can be really cathartic to talk to people and listen to people, uh, hear kind of shared experiences that people have, and you get a kind of sense of connection and, and power also from seeing that you're not the only one experiencing this. Um, and I wanted to kind of I see that as a really great tool for social change as well. Thanks very much, uh, Mary. And um... Absolutely, um, really uh, many of us share that same uh, uh, motivation or that, that same inspiration. Um, so um, thank you for uh, contextualizing us there. We're in Europe, Brexit, that needs to be mentioned, and restrictive policies um, and an organization seeking to, to enable the voices of uh, those in precarious sectors within these restrictive immigration systems. Um, Let's uh, now travel all the way to Latin America. We have uh, our third speaker, uh, speakers actually joining from Amumra. Um, we will hear from uh, Natividad Oveso. She is the president and founder of Amumra. It's a civil society human rights organization working with migrants and refugee women in Argentina. And she's joined by her colleague, Violeta Gonzalez Robledo, who is a biologist and human rights activist from Mexico. She's also vice president of uh, AMUNRA. Welcome to you both. I'm going to switch uh, very briefly to Spanish to say buenos dias. And I'm going to ask the first couple of questions in Spanish. Um, entonces, eh, bienvenidas, Natividad, Violeta. Por favor, eh, si alguna de ustedes pueda contarnos un poquito sobre AMUNRA y el trabajo que realizan en el área de migración y, y trabajo. Trabajadoras. Natividad, 
¿Tienes apagado el audio, Nati? Muy buenos días. Gracias por esta oportunidad de darnos a MUNRA, Asociación Civil de Derechos Humanos, Mujeres Unidas, Migrantes y Refugiadas en Argentina. AMUNRA surge en el 2001 a través de la lucha de las mujeres migrantes que reclamamos el derecho al acceso a la educación superior de nuestros hijos, quienes logramos el ingreso a la universidad en medio de un contexto de fuerte discriminación, estigmatización, racismo, xenofobia y violencia. ¿Me están escuchando? ¿Sí? Sí, sí, perfectamente. Perfecto. Yo no escucho nada. Bueno, Am AMUNRA es una organización civil sin fines de lucro, apartidaria, que busca mejorar la calidad de vida de las mujeres migrantes, refugiadas y de sus familias, sin distinción de nacionalidad, contribuyendo a la construcción de una sociedad más justa y democrática por medio de la promoción, defensa y vigilancia de sus derechos humanos desde una perspectiva de género. Los objetivos de la organización están encaminados a fortalecer y desarrollar las capacidades de las mujeres migrantes refugiadas a fin de favorecer su autonomía, desarrollar y fomentar su liderazgo en la toma de decisiones públicas y privadas incidir en el ámbito público para mejorar las políticas que promueven la equidad de género y el respeto a los derechos de las mujeres, especialmente de los colectivos de mujeres migrantes, refugiadas y desplazadas. Sus miembros son mujeres de distintas nacionalidades, como le dije, son de Bolivia, Colombia, Chile, Ecuador, México, Paraguay, Perú, Venezuela. A lo largo de más de 15 años, AMUNRA ha incidido en la aprobación de varias leyes, como la Ley de Migraciones, la 25871, la Ley del Refugiado, la 26175, la Convención de los Derechos de los Trabajadores Migrantes y sus Familias, la Ley de Trabajadoras de Casas Particulares, el eh, la Recomendación 26 del Protocolo CEDA, y AMUNRA trabaja incansablemente sobre la legislación para beneficio de los migrantes. Trabajamos específicamente con mujeres migrantes trabajadoras de casas particulares, es más nuestro eje principal, teniendo conocimiento que las mujeres migrantes, cuando llegan a un país de destino, obviamente su primer inserción laboral es como trabajadoras de casas particulares. Nosotros acá en Argentina decimos trabajadoras de casas particulares porque la ley 26844 lo especifica, porque decimos Nati, que no somos domésticas, sorry to sino interrupt. somos trabajadoras Nati. de casas particulares. Trabajamos con trabajadoras textiles, trabajadoras vendedoras ambulantes y horticultoras. Hola. Nati, ¿puedes hablar un poquito más despacio? Porque Liliana está traduciendo y no, 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 no llega a seguirte. Eh, un poquitito más despacio, más pausado, para que Liliana te pueda seguir el, el, para no la traducción al inglés. Nati. ¿Puedes hablar un poquito más pausado para que, Nati, eh, para que Liliana y Chusa puedan seguirte en la interpretación? Dale, perfecto. Perfecto. Este, ¿Desde dónde? ¿Hasta dónde me han escuchado? Si puedes repetir apenas la última parte donde estabas contando eh, lo último que dijiste. Ah, perfecto. Eh, bueno, eh, la, eh, a lo largo de más de 15 años, AMUNRA ha incidido en la aprobación de varias leyes. Nuestro objetivo principal es una buena legislación para las migrantes y para los migrantes. Hemos logrado la aprobación de la Ley de Migraciones, la 25871, 
la Ley del Refugiado, la 2665, la Ley de Trabajadoras de Casas Particulares, la 2644, la Convención de los Derechos de los Trabajadores Migrantes y sus Familias, la Recomendación 26 de Protocolo CEDA, que es específicamente de mujeres migrantes, que es la que siempre a todos los organismos les decimos que puedan tomar en cuenta, porque es específico para mujeres migrantes de protocolo de edad. Trabajamos también específicamente con mujeres migrantes trabajadoras de casas particulares, trabajadoras horticultoras, trabajadoras textiles y trabajadoras vendedoras ambulantes. La gran mayoría de ellas son obviamente trabajadoras informales en los países de destino y mucho más si son migrantes. Y también trabajamos, obviamente, por más por el empoderamiento de ellas hacia el logro de su autonomía de ellas, dada las violencias que sufren en un país de destino. Muchas gracias. Eh, eh, natividad, la verdad es que... Eh, no sé este... si me estarán escuchando. Hola, hola, hola. ¿Me escuchas? Hola, Natividad, ¿nos escuchas? No. Eh, a ver si hay algún problema con... con eh, que puedan resolver desde CatW... De, um, los compañeros que están haciendo apoyo técnico. Si no, bueno, mandarte, aunque sea en silencio, nuestro agradecimiento en actividad. Muchas gracias por la introducción y, y fuiste eh, muy eh, directo también a parte de lo que, a lo que vamos a discutir o conversar en, eh, hoy y a ese trabajo tan interesante que realizaron con trabajadores ambulantes, con mujeres en el, en el sector de eh, textil y también agricultura, por lo que eh, mencionabas. Quería, tal vez entonces, eh, pedir a Violeta si nos podías contar un poco más acerca del trabajo que están realizando con esos grupos, y la misma pregunta que a los demás, ¿qué les inspiró a adoptar esta, este, esta perspectiva, este approach de hacer eh, FPAR? Eh, ¿Nos puedes comentar, Violeta, mientras la actividad eh, se el agua? Gracias Lucila y gracias a todas las que están escuchando por el espacio y, y a todas las personas que están compartiendo esto que estamos eh, compartiendo, valga la redundancia. Bueno, eh, poniendo eh, también en, en, en tela lo que, lo que está diciendo Nati, que a través del trabajo de promoción, vigilancia, difusión y sensibilización, sensibilización sobre los diferentes marcos normativos en materia de derecho laboral, de derechos humanos y de género, es que, bueno, Amunra es que realiza este tipo de investigaciones e informes. Siempre en un trabajo voluntario y con un trabajo en conjunto, directo, básicamente en territorio. Porque creemos que a través del trabajo territorial, es que damos cuenta de las problemáticas que atraviesan las trabajadoras migrantes, en este caso lo que nos atañe de la investigación, trabajadoras de casa particular, trabajadoras ambulantes, trabajadoras eh, textiles y trabajadoras eh, horticultoras, que como dijo Nati, son uno de los principales, esos, esos trabajos, de los principales trabajos donde se inserta la población migrante, en, bueno, la población de mujeres migrantes en Argentina. Eh, la violencia a la que se enfrentan constantemente es cotidiana en sus trabajos. Nos increpa en Amunra en generar procesos donde podamos problematizar las dinámicas económicas, el ejercicio del poder, las relaciones entre empleadora, empleador, empleada, el trabajo formal e informal, el rol que juegan las instituciones también. Pero también las representaciones que cada mujer da a su espacio de trabajo, el impacto en su salud integral 
y las acciones que llevan a cabo en contra de la explotación laboral. Nosotras creemos que para transformar las condiciones de vulneración, primero hay que conocer a la comunidad migrante, sus diversidades, diferencias y complejidades en los espacios públicos, en los lugares donde los, las migrantes habitan. Para este estudio eh, que, que hicimos en conjunto con más organizaciones que integran la GAF, se hizo desde un enfoque de investigación acción participativa feminista, que fue de lo que hablaron anteriormente. Un enfoque donde, también to, donde se toma en cuenta a las personas con las que estamos involucrando esto, porque este estudio, este informe que realizamos, no fue sacado, como decimos vulgarmente, de la manga. Fue a través del trabajo que se hace en territorio. Fue a través de las voces de las mujeres que van constantemente a la organización reclamando que se ha vulnerado algún derecho. El enfoque interseccional nos permitió entender las experiencias de las participantes como producto de una interacción entre sus identidades, género, etnia, clase, social, eh, nacionalidad, en todos sus diferentes contextos. Las entrevistas fueron realizadas a profundidad a las trabajadoras y se hicieron grupos focales, los cuales fueron eh, en territorio. Eso fue muy importante porque fue hecho con un grupo focal en territorio en una comunidad llamada Florencio Varela, en la provincia de Buenos Aires, con mujeres que integran un, integran un grupo popular de defensa de derechos y también con mujeres aledañas que, que eran vecinas de esas mujeres que integraban el grupo. La comunicación con las trabajadoras cabe mencionar que fue muy fluida para que fueran a los grupos vocales y para que fueran a las entrevistas. Sin embargo, eh, algunas de ellas no, no fue tan fácil contactarlas debido a algunos obstáculos que fueron principalmente la, la falta de oportunidad que tienen a espacios de recreación y a espacios de vaya a espacios de tiempo que no sean los de trabajo, porque son arduas jornadas, aunque sean eh, principalmente las que son de cama adentro, hablando de trabajadoras de casa particular, y hablando de las trabajadoras ambulantes, el arduo trabajo que realizan durante muchas horas, que tiene que ser de caminata constante, y también que tiene que ser de huida constante de la fuerza pública, o de la violencia institucional que viven, entonces constantemente hay miedo. Eh, nosotras nos ubicamos en el barrio de Once, que es un barrio en la capital de Buenos Aires, donde confluyen gran cantidad de personas migrantes y donde el trabajo ambulante es, es el, el que prima y donde la policía siempre está, eh, pues como dicen vulgarmente, jodiendo. Y no solo eso, golpeando, amenazando, ultrajando y discriminando a todas las personas migrantes que están ahí haciendo su trabajo. Volviendo a esto, esa, esos fueron unos obstáculos que tuvimos para que algunas mujeres pudieran eh, acceder o que pudiéramos acercarnos a esas entrevistas con las otras. Fue generalmente fluido, porque digo fluido, porque muchas mujeres eh, son, están en contacto con la organización constantemente. Es como a veces, no sé, llegan a saludar y ahí se quedan platicando, pero constantemente estamos trabajando con ellas. Ya para ir cerrando, durante los grupos focales que hicimos fue muy interesante porque éramos desconocidas y terminamos siendo conocidas en nuestras problemáticas y en nuestra profunda eh, sensibilidad acerca de las violencias que estamos viviendo o que se estaban viviendo. Eh, no es que las mujeres migrantes que, que, que estuvieron participando con nosotras no reconocieran que existían violencias. Eran las herramientas que necesitamos para poder decirlas y para poder accionar ante ellas. Las violencias que, que, nosotras, eh, que, que se dijeron en los grupos, por ejemplo, fueron enfrentadas, sí, pero de una manera individual, es decir, al momento. Y también tenemos que las políticas públicas 
sobre todo en trabajo en Argentina, no hablan de este tema en específico. Por eso celebramos eh, la, la aprobación, o bueno, más bien que se tomara en cuenta el protocolo 190 de la OIT, que ahora esperamos se pueda poner en marcha y pueda tener un cambio, o no solo eso, en las políticas públicas laborales. Las trabajadoras migrantes pasan por situaciones de vulnerabilidad a sus derechos, violencias múltiples y, como dije, no son ajenas a saberse violentadas. Buscaron durante los encuentros vías de poder accionar ante ello y desde la investigación acción participativa feminista fue que pudimos encontrar un medio para poder acercarnos a conocer estas complejidades. Creemos que a partir de estas investigaciones la población, podemos tener conocimiento de la población y de los derechos que tenemos como trabajadoras. Las mujeres dieron sus puntos de vista y acciones donde pudieron, y acciones. Las voces indicaban que había que tener mayores espacios educativos, mayor, mayores espacios de escucha. Y en cuanto a las entrevistas eh, individuales, pudimos, pudimos saber que existen problemáticas y características similares y también particulares en la forma de enfrentar estas violencias. Creemos que tendríamos que dar mayor observancia a las políticas públicas. Creemos que estas investigaciones son parte importante para una transformación social y que las mujeres que participaron de ello ahora tenemos un contacto más estrecho y están constantemente eh, trabajando con la organización. Queremos ya para terminar decir que una de las personas que nos estuvo, que participó de los encuentros focales, que participó de, to de toda la organización, lamentablemente murió durante la cuarentena, no de COVID, pero fue Leticia un punto de anclaje y un punto muy importante para que pudiéramos llevar a cabo esta investigación. Nuestro mayor cariño a ella y sensibilidad por su partida, pero sabiendo que fue una mujer que trabajó en causa con nosotros y por los derechos de las mujeres migrantes. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Violeta. Eh, creo que eh, realmente hay que reconocer eh, el impacto que han tenido en los cambios legislativos, algo que sabemos que es muy difícil de, de alcanzar y lleva muchísimo, muchísimo esfuerzo y, y probablemente muchos años y aún así eh, muchas veces no se logra, así que fantástico ejemplo de cómo a través de, del uso de este tipo de metodologías y del trabajo que realiza la organización en programa general, eh, a través de esas caminatas, como decís, y del, de los años de, de trabajo en el territorio, eh, y tal vez mediante esta evolución natural o medio natural que es el EFPAR para ustedes de eh, facilitar esa participación logran resultados tan concretos ¿no? Ahí a nivel legislativo. Así que eh, ojalá tengamos tiempo de hablar más sobre, sobre ese trabajo. Voy a volver a hablar en inglés. I'm going to switch back to English. And the rest of the session will uh, re be run in English. Uh, just a heads up for our uh, translators. Thank you for your patience. Um, the next and last speaker from our panel is Menaka Raguparan. Uh, she's a Dr. Menaka Raguparan, is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Criminology at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, and an advisory board member for the Sex Workers Advocacy Network, SWAN, in Vancouver. Her research and teaching interests include sex work, human trafficking, critical race, criminology, and criminal justice system, intersections of racialization and sexuality, and South Asian, uh, South Asian Diaspora. Dr. Raguparan is the founder and co-chair of the Sex Work Law and Society uh, Group. It's a collaborative research network at the Law and Society Association. So same uh, question to you. Can you please tell us a bit more about the organization that you're representing, SWAN, its membership, the purpose of the network? And Thank you, everyone. Um, again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, whichever the time zone. Um, thanks for the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it has been an amazing conversation already. Or it's great to get to know the other work around the world. Um, so I am going to be representing SWAN primarily. Um, 
So for this section, I'll definitely tell you what SWAN is. SWAN is a grassroots organization based in Vancouver, Canada, that promotes the rights, health, and safety of migrant and immigrant women engaged in Indo sex work uh, through frontline services and systemic advocacy. Um, so the types of services that SWAN in, provides includes outreach to massage businesses uh, to deliver condoms and also connecting migrant and immigrant sex workers, um, connecting with migrant and uh, immigrant sex workers to answer questions and to provide resources in regards to health, social, anything social related, legal and labor immigration, labor, immigration and policing issues. Um, we also provide online outreach via text messages and social media apps uh, and other technology to migrant women who are in this precarious immigration status, uh, who are working in apartments and hotel rooms. And um, so the online is a way of keeping women anonymous because of their precarious uh, immigration status. So they are often undocumented. Um, the online protects anonymity for, for women's anonymity and even from us knowing who they are. So it's not required that SWAN needs to know who they are serve providing services to. Um, SWAN also has a bad date reporting system. Um, and then SWAN also provides various peer groups uh, through activities and events for women who build uh, community and solidarity. Thank you very much. Um, could you tell us, because you're wearing uh, two hats here, so you're representing SWAN and you're also, uh, you're also a researcher. So um, please tell us about your collaboration with SWAN. And I, I would imagine that is going to take us to an FBA research. And um, if you could tell us a little bit about how that came to be, how you got involved in doing FBA. Um, So my relationship with SWAN has been very long as a researcher. Um, I started with my personal project for my doctoral project, interviewing women of color um, in the sex industry, Indo sex industry in Canada. So I traveled right across the country to interview them. And which was of course participant reaction research and I'm a feminist, SWAN is a feminist organization so there is this fundamental principle collaboration was easy. Um, so SWAN's objective I can say as a feminist organization is about engaging in various feminist practices right uh, which also which includes fundamentally empowering migrant and immigrant sex workers and operating from uh, the migrant and immigrant sex workers standpoint to address their specific needs. My personal values also fit with SWAN. So that's where as a researcher and at SWAN, we, we collaborated. So the particular project that I wanted to focus on today is there is a third element, uh, is the most recent FPA project, which is in partnership with GATW. So I thought that would be apt for me to bring that up. Um, we also drumming up some attention towards the research. <laughs> Um, so, and which I take a lead role in the research, uh, in conducting the research and all that stuff. So the research basically examines how migrant and immigrant women are integrating into the Canadian labor force and what type of services that they already have or that they need to successfully integrate into the Canadian labor force. So when we are, so the, and so GATW asked us to of course use a FAR, FPA, but that was not a problem because that was our fundamental values, uh, both SWAN and my value and our principles. So it was just a, you know, obvious thing. So I'll quickly tell you a little bit about the research. So using feminist practices, we interviewed 30 women uh, from between January 2020 and, Jan sorry, October 2020 and January 2021. The participants varied in diversity and their demography, such as race, age, citizenship, education, employment, skills, the various skills that they had. Uh, almost all of the women were interviewed in person. Mind you, in a pandemic, we managed to do in-person interviews. I'll talk about the challenges in a bit. <laughs> um, just a couple of the interviews were phone and Zoom just for women's convenience. Um, even though this research was conducted during the pandemic, it was, so the intentional aspect of having a in-person was to meet the principles of power. Um, I trained three of the staff members in SWAN uh, to conduct the interviews. Um, and the interviews were conducted in different languages, uh, mostly in Chinese. Um, 
in the Chinese, uh, Cantonese and Mandarin, um, and then of course English. Um, and the, so the qualitative and the feminist aspect of the interviews were that the re researchers were trained in a non-judgmental, empathetic and active listening approach, and then validating experience. So not questioning women's stories or not interpreting them, rather taking their stories as facts or as truth, statements of truth, right? What they say is what it is. Um, so the questions were also open-ended, which meant that the women get to tell the story that they want to tell. I may have uh, guiding or probing questions, but we start with the, with the prompt saying, this is your life, this is your story, you get to tell me what you want. And that's exactly how we went. So women decided how deep the interviews were or how um, you know, minimal that they wanted to share. So that was completely up to them. They had that decision. And of course, one of the questions that we had very specifically was asking them directly, what did they want from SWAN? How can SWAN help them? How, what they needed from SWAN? What did SWAN needed to do for them? And of course, from that, we came up with the analysis, you know, as I analyzed the data, there were three major themes that came out of it. So the first thing that they wanted was English language training because most of them were migrants and immigrants did not have English knowledge and they wanted that. They wanted better knowledge of the immigration policy and procedures. So often we noticed women didn't understand what their status was, what their citizenship rights were, what their permanent residency rights were, what their employment uh, permit allowed them or not allowed them to do. And then of course they wanted peer support. So in terms of our action, of course, you know, the action driven, uh, data driven action, the actions right now are being implemented. Uh, so English language training is on being at the beginning of it. So infancy, we are trying to do English training for women by staff, but the English training was general English speaking, plus uh, having this uh, element of labor rights to for them women to know what the rights are in Canada. And then uh, we also had a webinar because it's the pandemic. Uh, it was titled um, Paths to Immigration. This was in English Mandarin, offered in English Mandarin and Cantonese. And it basically involved on what the immigration policy is, which is what women ask for. The peer support aspect is ongoing because that's something SWAN has always been doing um, in terms of offering the peer support. It's a fundamental service of uh, SWAN. I also then quickly, like I mentioned, the challenges in terms of doing PAR, FPA specifically, is two types, right? One is the practical element of it, and then there is the conceptual element. So the practical element, as you can understand, uh, in a pandemic, you know, it's very hard to maintain a closeness with the participant, build rapport, build some kind of trust, um, you know, with the mask on, so you can't read facial expressions, you can't read uh, body languages because you're sitting six feet apart, uh, all of these challenges. So, you know, you can just, it's obvious and it's easy to understand. However, the conceptual aspect, I think this is where the Canadian context comes very different from many other regions that I've so far heard, is to do with this person of an insider and an outsider, right? As a feminist researcher, we need, we are insiders, like, you know, as a woman of color, I'm an insider trying to understand other women of color's experiences. Um, and so there is an element of resonance, there is an element of trust, there is an element of somewhat shared, not entirely, but somewhat shared experiences, which is asset, right, which gives value for feminist research and action research. However, what I have noticed in my experience as a feminist scholar that that element of being insider puts you also an outsider and has posed many challenges in the country. So I, and I'm believing, beginning to believe that it might be very unique to a Canadian situation, especially with policy related actions, right? Um, so two things are coming out of it. The participants do not, or at least from this project, they didn't want any action uh, in the sense of policy. Um, so what they understood as their immigration immigration problem or what they understood as their problem in Canada or their integration into the Canadian system, they didn't see that as a systemic problem. 
but re rather it a personal problem and therefore they didn't want any particular action. So even if there was exploitation that they experienced in the labor market, they didn't want to take action against it. It was a very confidential information that they shared with us in the hope of being confidential. So as a feminist, we need to maintain that confidentiality and that guaranteeing of confidentiality that gives us this rich information. But at the same time, we cannot do anything about it. Like, you know, that data is, you know, we have this wealth of data and I can't do anything about it because the women tell me don't do anything about it. So that's one aspect of it. Second, as an informed researcher, having had multiple cases and if I go into policy matters or if I decide to go into uh, speaking without the specific data, without the women, if I go and try to advocate for things like this, then my identity is questioned. Because I'm a woman of color, it becomes anecdotal if I don't bring the actual evidence with me, but I can't bring the evidence because that's confidentiality, we need to protect the privacy, all of those stuff. But then my, because a person of color, because, uh, you know, and also because I'm not a sex worker, my credibility is questioned. So, and then it's like, oh, it's anecdotal. Um, and as a result, you know, a lot of the policy matters, we are noticing that we are not making much headways in terms of it. And I'm wondering whether it has to do with this, uh, the feminist practice of maintaining confidential. And of course, we cannot go against the fundamental principles of those things, right? Um, so those are some of the challenges. I don't know how I'm doing for time. And I'm not sure if I explained the con conceptual aspect of it, but I'm sure we can talk about it more. So if there are any questions, I'll stop there for now. Thank you very much, Minaka. Um, we are, of course, running over, but it's uh, completely understandable when we're talking about such a fascinating topic. And there's uh, a lot to be said and a lot of uh, experience uh, in this panel. So um, no worries at all. And there will be hopefully a chance for, for us to revisit some of these points. But thank you for the concrete examples, which uh, we can we will encourage all panelists to to share um, from your experience and some of the dilemmas that are uh, you've been uh, facing uh, as a, a, in this journey. Um, great to see also that there is a kind of a common thread across the panel around motivation and this uh, the importance of or the link, uh, the strong links with your personal values, the personal feminist values, and 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 there be no sort of uh, sudden uh, idea of doing a bar. It 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 is a, a link to a, a long term, uh, deeper commitment to to feminist principles. And we will uh, talk a bit after the break about what this means uh, for for you and how you see feminist principles. Um, uh, being implemented through an FPAR approach. What do we mean by that? But then we we'll also talk about uh, what FPAR looks in practice. So how do you actually apply an FPAR approach um, and some of the challenges that you've already touched on, Menaka. So thank you for that. We're gonna go now to a five minute break. I um, believe my colleagues from GatW will uh, play some music. So when you uh, realize that there's no more music, please come back to your uh, device, your computer, your phone. It's time to come back and we'll keep uh, asking some, uh, some of our questions to the panel and then open the floor to your questions. Hi everyone, welcome back. That seemed um, shorter than five minutes, <laughs> uh, but great to be back. Um, we'll soon open the, the, the floor for questions, for your questions. Uh, but uh, just a reminder, post your questions on the Q&A uh, chat. Uh, with my colleagues will be picking it up and Sharmila will be facilitating that, that bit of the session next. But before we move on to that, I wanted to ask our panels, um, our panelists, uh, a question for all of you. How do we build uh, feminist knowledge? And, and what would be one key principle of doing FPAR that you'd want to highlight um, as part of that process? So we can start with Kamei Lau. I'll ask everyone um, to please uh, remind, um, keep it um, to one principle, just considering that there are so many really interesting questions coming through from the audience. So two minutes each, Kamei. Would you like to start? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, that is a really good question. And I think one of the key principle is that FPAR aims to shift power. We have a process in the very beginning when we started the FPAR um, with our partners. First of all, the organization we set up their research topics and designed the research proposal. But before they started to carry out the plan, they have to go back to the community to discuss the research proposal with their community, to consult their opinions, to make sure the topic and impact objective is really the pressing issues that they are most concerned. Sometimes it does happen that the community member do not fully agree with the topic or they have some opinions on the objectives, the research questions. So in this uh, very interesting consultation process, the organization at the same time will recruit and identify the co-researchers. So usually the, the researcher come from the organization, but at the same time, they identify some community members, the women workers to become the part of the research team. So these co-researchers are the migrants women workers who committed herself themselves to involve in the FPAR. So it really changed the power and the role of the interviewees or subjects that's in the traditional research. And the women and the community contribute the story and at the same time shaping the research that design and direction. And it made the community have a very strong ownership of the research while the knowledge and planning fully come from the community to make sure that's the migrants women speak for themselves through the FPAR and FPAR become a tool or a platform to amplify their voices. And um, some of our partners, not only doing the consultations with the, their constituency, with the migrants women workers, but also to other stakeholders. For example, our Indian partners work with sex workers. They do consultation and engage with the migrant sex workers, the local sex workers, different uh, local NGOs or fam uh, feminist NGOs, residents, uh, community or house owner to understand and have a full pictures of how people understand their work and their research. So in the consultation, some of the group, they have changed their mind from in the beginning, not so supportive because of their perception of sex work to later become more neutral or become more supportive on what they are doing. So it's really amazing to see how the FPA partners put this principle into practice. Very much. So maintaining the eyes on the prize and change driving the whole process. Um, who would like to come in and build on this? What other key principles or ways of building feminist knowledge you'd like to highlight? Um, shall we? Let me invite Mary then to come in. Sure. Um, I think that sounds like a fantastic what Kame was talking about, kind of going back to people um, and kind of seeking out that perspective. That was one of the kind of things I wanted to highlight as well around making space for and, and kind of actively seeking people's voices and perspectives um, and not kind of assuming that they'll come to you and specifically trying to include the voices of people who are minoritized or, or traditionally othered groups that aren't included in research. So this is what we often see is that kind of official statistics don't include the people who we work with um, and trying to make sure that there is research and evidence and data that also shows their perspectives and that those people have a chance to shape that data as well and that it's not kind of coming from the top down. Um, in terms of a kind of principle of feminist research, I wanted to highlight one that's maybe a bit particular to our context because we're not a frontline organization and we don't or a network of frontline organizations but we do work closely with frontline organizations and I think that was really key for us doing FPAR is that we had connections and and understood the sector and, and worked closely with organizations um, and that we didn't kind of or at least we're avoiding kind of parachuting in and making sure instead that because people have complex support needs, potentially our research participants needed support with a lot of different issues that we weren't just there for kind of the knowledge building or extraction, but also could work with people to, to then support them to get help, get information um, and had those contacts to do that. And that as an organization, we also set a goal for ourselves that we were gonna make 
the participatory element really the priority um, and that that required a lot of flexibility a lot of learning adapting being flexible with time frames doing long-term engagement not like oh we're going to do this for a year but kind of we're doing this at least for three years hopefully longer um, and how are we going to learn and adapt to that context um, so i think that would be it from me thank you Violeta or Natividad, and then Menaka, feel free to jump in. Hola. Bueno, eh, una pregunta muy interesante y a la vez me, como me, me digo, ¿por dónde empiezo? Eh, bueno, desde el feminismo, cuestionar las prácticas vigentes, nuestras propias prácticas, cotidianidades, en clave a todo lo, lo que nos rodea, ¿no? a nuestras diferencias, diversidades, para transformar las formas tradicionales de nuestros pensamientos, del pensamiento, las narraciones y perspectivas hegemónicas. Sobre todo para mí, este tipo de pensamiento feminista o de acciones nos invita o me gustaría hablar de la desobediencia y de crear nuevas narraciones sobre cómo, el cómo queremos construir nuestras vidas en conjunto. Eh, creo que todo este entramado feminista de acción no hubiera sido posible sin el trabajo de muchas mujeres y disidencias en la lucha popular, la, las que nos dieron pauta de pensarnos en otras claves. Para la migración laboral, desde el feminismo, nosotras pensamos que quizá puede haber muchas más, podríamos abordarla desde, desde varios sentidos. Por ejemplo, tomando en cuenta el análisis de las categorías como raza, etnia, clase, edad, preferencia sexual y, y, y otro podría ser entendernos como, que, que entendernos como migrantes ¿sí? y únicamente ver solo sus causas no es suficiente. La migración es movimiento. Habría, tendríamos que, en esta investigación, nos permitiría incluir nuestras trayectorias, los nodos que la integran, las funciones de las políticas públicas, las violencias, la discriminación, pero también entender e incorporar nuestros territorios, nuestras vidas en conjunto con otras en un entorno global para tomar acciones en conjunto. Que estas investigaciones que estamos en las que estamos incluyendo nuestras diversidades y nuestras diferencias influyan en las políticas públicas vigentes. Políticas públicas que son aún binarias, leyes binarias, sin perspectiva de género, ¿sí? donde aún no se incluye completamente la acción popular. Cuando hablamos de una política pública, aún la hablamos en un sentido hegemónico y de poder, en un sentido binario. Las disidencias migrantes, las mujeres migrantes, muchas veces quedan excluidas. Creemos que el trabajo puede ser donde se incluyan esas voces. Por ejemplo, con los tribunales que hizo Amunra este año, donde mujeres migrantes que habían sido violentadas pudieron hablar Ahí, Nati, que nos explique en un minuto porque nos queda poco tiempo. Sí, eh, yo quería un poco eh, aportar con respecto a cómo construimos conocimiento feminista. Eh, creo que específicamente las mujeres migrantes venimos de, un, de una violencia muy fuerte que es el machismo, ¿no? Las grandes... Eh, 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 venimos insertadas de un patriarcado que no, impuesto en nuestros países de origen y creo que eh, eh, uno de los principios claves para haber realizado esta investigación y que desde Amunra damos muchas gracias a la GAT es cuando recibí por primera vez el llamado de la GAT que nos dijeron que queríamos hacer si podíamos hacer una investigación y, pero por sobre todo cuando nos plantearon eh, los diferentes abusos que se daban en el trabajo, las, extracciones, las estrategias o acciones que servirían para estos abusos, 
las extracciones, las extracciones o acciones que ayudan a las personas a superarlos y a recuperar su proyecto de vida. ¡Wow! Dijimos nosotros en el Amunra, porque dijimos, nunca nos preguntaron esto, alguna organización. Y la verdad que eso nos ayudó muchísimo, porque era como que veíamos plasmado nosotros lo que queríamos hacer, porque recuerden que nosotros somos una asociación de base territorial, que es muy diferente, eh, que muchas veces estas asociaciones a veces lleguemos a instancias mucho más este, amplias. Creo que también lo que, lo, que, lo que ayuda muchísimo en esto y uno de los principios claves de esta investigación es la confianza que puede haber entre la, la, la organización y las voces, ¿no? La organización que se está comunicando con ellas y la credibilidad que podamos dar como organización el trabajo diario que nos ven haciendo y que vamos llevando adelante. Las, las, sobre todo las respuestas que damos a ellas, que siempre cuando se comunican ellas con nosotros, realmente siempre tienen una respuesta, ¿no? Eso también ayuda muchísimo. Eh, lo, también otra cosa que, que ayuda para la investigación es que eh, eh, nos ayudó mucho a nosotros, es que era una, una investigación que era específico para migrantes, porque la gran mayoría de investigaciones en el mundo no son específicos para migrantes que nos hayan llegado a nosotras. Entonces creo que eso es muy importante, eh, de que desde las propias voces, desde nuestras propias compañeras, y que por ahí tal vez el trabajo que realiza la MUNRO en propio territorio, si ellas nos dicen que no pueden, nosotras le decimos, nosotras vamos. Creo que esa también es como que una herramienta principal como para, para que ellas puedan confiar en nosotras y que no se sientan utilizadas, ¿no? porque muchas veces nos han dicho, nos utilizan y después ni siquiera tenemos conocimiento, no nos mandan decir, son cosas que realmente son muy importantes a tomar en cuenta. Parece que tal vez no, pero creo que son cosas para tomar en cuenta. Ya dentro de los años de trabajo que venimos desarrollando en Amunra, realmente creo que hemos podido incidir en la política pública. De hecho, este, este, esta investigación nos ayudó mucho porque era cómo mostrar realmente la violencia laboral que sufren las mujeres migrantes para la aprobación del convenio 189, de 190 de la OIT. Creo que eso era importante que por primera vez podamos estar las mujeres migrantes en, en, en estas eh, instancias internacionales y que nos puedan tomar en cuenta, ¿no? Eh, no me quiero alargar más porque cuando empieza a hablar la natividad se va, pero así, pero creo que eso es lo más importante y la verdad agradecemos una vez más a la GAT por todo este apoyo y este acompañamiento. Como le digo muchas veces a ellas, a mí mándenme al territorio, mándenme a ensuciarme los pies de barro. Gracias. Thank you, Menaka. Um, I'll keep it very brief, and I think I wanted to focus more on the action item. So, like many of my panelists, co-panelists have talked about, talked about power is an important thing, and a feminist uh, power is about you know, balancing off the power or taking, giving more power to women, uh, participants, the community. In, the, in that same sense, I wanted to emphasize that if the participants, the community says that what they're doing is sharing knowledge and looking for validation, and that's it, right? There isn't an action so specific, uh, such as advocacy in the sense of changing the world, you know, a lot of these women, at least in my experience, many of the women I spoke to just wanted to be heard, uh, just wanted to be felt important, that their voice was included. And that's it, right? They didn't want the world to change. They're like, just leave me be it. And I want to be, you know, anonymous and secret. I remember one of the famous quotes, uh, one of my participants, many of my participants said it was a unanimous quote. We will tell you our story and I'll trust you with it, you use your smarts and go do whatever you need to do, but keep me out of this, right? And I take that deep into my heart and that's what I try to do, but that has limitation. So understanding and giving that 
power and it is a feminist principle and it is a principle of power to say it may not have an action item and that's okay. Thank you very much, Tanaka. And I feel like you're already touching on our, our next question, but um, just a, a bit of reflection on this and, uh, and, and just to recap some of the principles or the um, aspirations behind uh, some of this work and, and um, this uh, kind of uh, the, the point about highlighting how FBAR may be a research process, but it's also a process of ongoing self-reflection as feminist practices and a process of personal change um, that it requires us to uh, dare to be disruptive um, and a call to ensure that trust is not misused, that uh, participants are not simply participants from for a research project, but whole humans that have needs and that we are ready and committed to respond and accompany those needs so thank you very much for all all this uh, uh, this input. It's been fantastic. We have, as I said, we are of course running over time. But um, picking up on your point about action, uh, I wanted to see if uh, you could share some very concrete examples where uh, research has actually supported action. Um, are there any examples that you want to share from your experience? And we can actually start with you, Menaka. Let's go around the um, the opposite order. I'm sorry, I was trying to answer some of the questions on the chat too. Um, so, in terms of concrete actions, yes. Um, so things like you know what women asked for, we have been able to deliver what they want us to deliver. Um, such as, you know, English training. And it might seem very trivial, like what's the big deal in English training? But, you know, that's what they wanted. That's what they feel the need is. So we have been able to do it. Um, they clearly said, I don't understand the Canadian immigration process. I don't understand how the work permit works. So we have taken that seriously. So, um, sorry, Lucilia, can you repeat your question? So it was the concrete actions. And what was the other one? Just concrete actions that you want to share from your experience about uh, where, how we're using research for action. So something that can illustrate what this means in practice. Yeah, so I think I will, you know, keep with those. And the pandemic hasn't been an issue, and for specifically for Swan, because most of Swan women are, um, they want to stay anonymous. They never want to reveal their identity. So even in the past, it has been online webinars and trainings. And so we are just continuing that. In fact, during the pandemic, the participation has been much higher. Um, you know, I guess they want to be more connected. Um, so the, the SWAN is way more busier than it used to be in the past, literally serving women and, you know, responding to their needs. Thank you. Uh, Natividad or uh, Violeta? Do you want to? Sí, ¿Me puedes volver a repetir la pregunta, por favor? Sí, claro. Um, sorry, uh, switching to Spanish now, interpreters. Um, entonces, la pregunta es, estamos hablando de acción. Y eh, tal vez eh, también para gente que no esté escuchando, nos esté escuchando, que esté interesado en, interesadas en eh, empezar a hacer ESPA, si pudieras compartir algún ejemplo de tu trabajo donde de hecho se utiliza esta investigación para conseguir o para llevar adelante una acción, ¿no? una acción de cambio. Entonces un ejemplo concreto, eh, si es que pudieras compartir algo de tu experiencia o de lo que están planeando hacer. Eh, bueno, creo que una de las acciones este, concretas de la experiencia de, de la MUNRA creo que es este, el trabajo que hacemos directamente con ellas hacia el empoderamiento de ellas para que puedan lograr su autonomía. Creo que es eso para ellas una satisfacción al llegar a la organización que no tiene ningún conocimiento que hay alguna organización y ellas a partir de ese momento empiezan a tener confianza, ¿no? Eh, a veces nos da ganas de filmar a las personas cuando llegan a la organización por primera vez y luego después de mucho tiempo verlas realmente 
cómo ya ellas defienden, se defienden por sí mismas, ¿no? O sea, creo que un poco en la organización planteamos, eh, le damos la caña para pescar, no el pescado, creo que es como un dicho, para que ellas realmente sientan que el trabajo dignifica al ser humano, pero que también a la vez de dignificar, ellas no deben de aceptar ninguna explotación, ninguna violencia, ¿no? Que sientan que ellas se sienten acompañadas, que sientan que se, ellas se sienten apoyadas. Y creo que una de las mejores acciones es cuando llegan a la organización, nosotros no les preguntamos, eh, mira, esto podemos hacer por ustedes, no. Les preguntamos primero a ellas, ¿qué es lo que necesitas? ¿En qué quieres que te apoyemos? ¿Qué podemos hacer por vos? Creo que esas son la, la, las, las acciones de confianza que las mujeres quieren para poder ellas confiar en el otro o en la otra y de esta manera eh, realizar nuestro trabajo. Creo que prueba de ello es también un poco eh, toda la legislación de migrantes que se ha trabajado desde la MUNRA eh, y se ha aprobado, ¿no? O sea, acción que hacemos, acción que tratamos de resolver, creo que eso también es importante, porque dar seguimiento a todo trabajo que desarrollamos, darles una información verídica, actualizada. Creo que también eso es muy importante. Siempre estamos continuamente actualizando la información para ellas, para que puedan tener respuestas. ¿no? Eh, la asesora laboral, por ejemplo, de la organización, tiene mucho trabajo ella, pero porque también damos seguimiento a, a, a la misma a, a asesora laboral para que también ella pueda tener herramientas, porque obviamente las migrantes, eh, si es que no están regularizadas eh, el tema de la erradicación, creo que también eso es muy importante, lograr la, radica, la, la erradicación de las migrantes en el país de destino, porque si es que no están radicadas, por más que queramos hacer muchas cosas por ellas, no se puede hacer. Entonces creo que son esas, esas acciones que hacemos nosotros, tenemos una carpa itinerante donde realmente salimos a los, diferentes, a los diferentes barrios, hacemos mesas de diálogo eh, y que lo hacemos siempre en el Congreso, donde ellas muchas veces dicen, wow, pero yo sabía que, yo no creía que podía llegar acá. Entonces, creo que en base a eso, esa mujer se va sintiendo empoderada, va un poco, este... Eh, echando afuera la violencia poco a poco, porque cuando nosotros iniciamos con ellas, ellas, nadie te dice yo sufro violencia, nadie, ni en el trabajo, ni en ellas mismas. Cuando empezamos a decirle muchas cosas, a ver, esto te pasa a vos, a vos tu marido te dice esto, a vos tu empleadora te dice esto, entonces, sí, bueno, eso es violencia. Creo que es un poco darles eh, las la respuestas que ellas necesitan, también desde una manera, teniendo en cuenta su cultura, de las cuales ellas traen desde sus propios países de destino, ¿no? Porque muchas veces queremos ponerlas a todas en conjunto y no es así. No es lo mismo una boliviana que una peruana, no es lo mismo una colombiana que una española, no es lo mismo una eh, dominicana que una eh, paraguaya, eh, también lo que nos ayuda mucho es que hay mujeres que hablan el quechua, el guaraní, el aymara, ¿no? Entonces, nosotros tenemos compañeras que cuando nosotras no la podemos entender, ellas las llamamos y también eh, ellas hacen la traducción, ¿no? Cuando salimos a los barrios, hacemos muchas acciones. No, no quiero eh, agrandar más esa cosa, pero creo que que eso es lo más específico un poco, la confianza y sobre todo la responsabilidad también como organización, ¿no? Muchas gracias y muy eh, buena la descripción de hacer ese tipo de trabajo como una forma de echar fuera la violencia, me voy a quedar con, con eso. Eh, bien, Mary y luego Kaime. Let me know if you need me to reply. I think that was you saying it with me next, but I was still hearing the Spanish. Okay, brilliant. Um, so for us, to be honest, the action part has been one of the most challenging parts, I think also because of 
who we are. So we're not a campaigning or, a, or an organizing organization, um, but also the project where we were working in three different sectors. Uh, we were working with multiple nationality groups, are working with multiple nationality groups um, in multiple sectors with multiple language barriers. Um, so to kind of build a group or, or do group action has been quite challenging for us, but we found ways of kind of trying to do um, actions a little bit more individually, but also supporting and, and kind of linking uh, peer researchers with, for instance, journalists. So we've had multiple of our researchers and research participants speaking to the media to tell their stories themselves. Um, writing blogs that are then published on our website. So again, they can, in their own words, talk about their experience and the issues and the changes that they want to see. Contributing to policy consultations. So the kind of usual channels that we would use to influence policy to try to bring workers from the sectors into that process and, and have their voices heard. Um, our peer researchers are currently working with a videographer to create a video about their experience, about the issues they're experiencing at work to talk about it rather than to necessarily have to do a written uh, format but to have a kind of video and a visual format um, and I think in terms of the action I think it, it's really important to remember the kind of transformative aspect of that as well I think it's been really transformative for us as an organization and we're really at the start of our journey in doing this um, but it's taught us so much about the value of doing this kind of work and the value of being flexible, being adapting, trying new things, testing this, testing that to see how we can kind of increase participation and, and reach that goal that um, is really to, to create a platform and have people's voices heard. Um, but from speaking to peer researchers, from also having done interviews and, and focus groups with some of the participants and joined those focus groups, just doing the research has also been really transformative for peer researchers to be in that position of researcher, to be the ones asking the questions, to be the ones kind of listening and providing support to their peers, having the knowledge of, well, this is actually a problem that we're seeing in a lot of cases and, and you can go and get the support from these organizations or also just recognizing what are issues. So for instance, we've talked a lot about sexual harassment and then people have come back and first have said, well, no, actually, I don't experience that. And then later, there have been more discussions and then an identification of, okay, what I was experiencing was sexual harassment. And are there channels for me to address that? Um, what we're also trying to do, because we're not a frontline organization, is to make sure that the data we have is available to frontline organizations who can use it for campaigning, for instance, and, and that we share that data and present that back. Um, so that's been another kind of form of action that we've been trying to take, but we're trying a lot of different avenues and we're still in that testing phase. We still have, we're still doing this work at the moment. Thank you. Um, Kaime? Yeah, thank you. And for talking about the action phase, um, we actually, we are right now in the process to finalizing the research uh, reports with our FPA partners. And after we finalize the reports, all the stories, data that we have finalized and all the recommendations and demands, and we will come to another phase we call advocacy phase. So we encourage our partners to develop the national advocacy plan because we understand that different uh, organizations, they have their different strategies, their different concerns and different demands. So we encourage and also provide training for them to develop their advocacy plan, which is based on the fundings. So this is uh, evidence supports, evidence-based advocacy. But um, besides uh, supporting uh, our partners to build up their own advocacy plan, we also trying to see FPAR as a space for the movement building and linking those advocacy work in different countries. One concrete example is we have see some advocacy collaborations between our partners. One is um, the Indonesian Migrants Workers Union, IMU in Hong Kong, which is a trade unions organizing migrant domestic workers in destination countries. And they focus on the overcharging issues of the employment agencies and um, there's an other organization uh, in Indonesia um, 
which uh, supports the migrant returnees in Indonesia called Kababumi, which is the origin countries, focus on the document confiscation by the training school and the agencies in the countries of origins. So these two issues happen in different places, but which is one is the overcharging of agency fee in destination countries and the document confiscation in the origin countries, which is very closely related. Actually, that is the one issues, but usually the organization works separately. Their campaign, their work is separately happen in two different places. So, um, but um, for the Indonesian migrant domestic workers, for them, which is a very common experience is they need to pay a very high agency fee to get the job opportunity to work in Hong Kong. And without any choice, they need to sign a loan agreement and pay the debt by deducting their salary every month. So in order to control the workers, the training school in Indonesia will confiscate the documents, their ID cards, their family cards, their di diploma certificates, or even land certificates with original copy. So it is a very long existing practice and problems, which is illegal, but very difficult for migrant workers to collect evidence and seek for justice. So these two, our two Afro partners, they collect the data and cases and share together and successfully support some of the workers to retain their documents. And they also organize study group to study, to understand the issues and policy on both countries and uh, organize some joint campaign at the Indonesian embassy and relevant, some relevant government departments to push the authorities to respond and take actions. So I think this is some uh, examples to show how organizations from country of origin and country of destination work together. And I think it, it is especially crucial for migrant rights activists to build up the movement and advocacy together. Mm. Thanks very much. And thank you to all of you for, for uh, such an uh, interesting range of, of examples of, of what uh, placing women workers or marginalized workers in the center might look like. Um, thank you to all the panelists again for your generosity. Um, I'm going to now pass on to my, my colleague Sharmila for the Q&A session. So, hi everyone. Let's um, let's try to cover as much as we can in the limited time we have left. So I'd also like to ask the panelists, just just keep in mind that we we don't have that much time anymore. But let's try. So one common question we got was how is FPAR different from other types of research? But as Lucila said, this is something we our panelists have already covered quite extensively. Um, when they talked about the key principles of FPAR. So I'll move on to the next question, which is, um, so how to overcome challenges when researchers can't get close, when they can't see expressions or feel what the source is telling us because the pandemic situation is all online. Um, so does anyone among our panelists wanna take this? doing FPAR in an online context, in a pandemic context. Um, uh, Mary, yes, please. Um, I'm happy to talk about that because about, about half of our data collection has been during COVID. Um, and we started out doing, all of our research was in person. Um, and then we had to move online because of the UK going into complete lockdown last March. Um, and we still wanted to keep engaging and kind of not, not lose the relationships that we'd built um, and to keep moving on with the, the research. And it's definitely been challenging. It's, it does mean also that you can't go out and reach out to people in the same way. There's a lot of people kind of trying to use the same channels online um, as everyone else and kind of people being flooded by requests to join in surveys or interviews and, and so on from many different directions. Um, but I think it's also enabled participation from people who wouldn't necessarily otherwise have been part of our, our project. So uh, people from outside, we're based in London and a lot of our peer researchers were also based in London because of us being based in London. Um, and suddenly we could engage with people from Bristol or from Scotland or really much further than, than before. Um, and also there were a lot of challenges of doing kind of in-person 
focus groups, for instance, where people had to then find the time they had to travel to the place where the focus group was, they had to take, they, people had really flexible changing work schedules, so potentially weren't able to do that always. Whereas when things were online, it made it a lot easier for people to, to engage. Um, and what has also, I think, really contributed to that is we've had these group discussions online and they're read, they're, we make sure that they're in the language, the first language of participants um, and that they're led by a peer, so they're peer led, they're it's someone with similar experiences um, leading the discussion who can talk from their own experience, ask questions, prompt people. Um, and I think that's really helped as well. It kind of reduces the distance um, that's there. But I mean, hopefully if we, when we can go back, I would definitely want to do a kind of mix of online and in person because there's definitely a lot that you lose when you do online. Thank you, Mary. Um, I'm going to call on Kami, and then after that, we'll move on to the next question. But before that, I also want to call your attention to the Q&A channel. So some of our panelists, like Menaka, has been answering the questions um, on the Q&A channel as well. So please track that. And for our other panelists as well, if you want to respond on the Q&A channel so that our participants can see the responses, please, please feel free to do that. So Kame, uh, back to you on the question about doing FBAR in pandemic times. Yeah, and it's really cannot deny that uh, the challenges happen in the pandemic, which really shows the digital divide in some areas, especially for our partners in some rural areas or without a very good internet connections and or the internet um, fee is so high. And this is really, really un really cannot deny that is a real issues here. But I also see that how our partners really creatively to, to change the way of organizing and the way that they usually work. And in the pandemic, the, the, the concerns of the workers also change because they lost their job and some of them is under the lockdown, they cannot go out. So they really uh, need the support of very basic thing like food or some medicine that is very basic need that they, they cannot uh, achieve by themselves. So our partners that they try to seek for, they try to combine their organizing work and also the humanitarian supports that they ask for some donors or some social supports to get some physical, some, some, uh, some tangibles, materials, and then send to the um, reach out to the um, their members and at the same time uh, do the organizing work, uh, do capacity building and also collecting the data. So they try to change the way that they work. And other way that we try to do is to um, build up the capacity on how to use the online and digital way to, to maintain the connections. And one very interesting example that's our Indian Indian partners that they organize the sex workers, they try to also teach the sex workers to use the online um, different social medias or platform. And then the, their sex workers also use these kind of skills to maintain their uh, connections and communications with the customer so that they can, at least in the pandemic time, they still can earn a living uh, based on the online means. So uh, this is some ex example that we try to overcome the challenges that happen in during the pandemic. Thank you so much, Kami. So another question um, we got is, so based on what we've been hearing from, from our panelists, right? FBAR seems like it implies a very lengthy, intensive, in-depth research process, right? It's not easy ensuring participation. Um, so this requires funding. This is not cheap, right? So from the donor's perspective, it's also something that takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. Um, how do we address this issue? Uh, how do we present this to donors, for example? How do we make the case? Um, does anyone in the panel? Anyone in the panel want to take this? I can take a shot Menaka, at that. Thank you. Um, mainly because this is an everyday struggle for me as an academic trying to apply for grants. Um, so it, I think it fundamentally, there's no easy way. That's my answer, unfortunately. Um, because Feminist Power has fundamental principles. And if we are not committed to those fundamental principles, this doesn't work, right? And I don't believe there is any shortcut to 
or compromising those fundamental principles, then it doesn't become the feminist part. You know, it becomes the traditional research methods. Um, so it takes a lot of effort explaining, or at least in my experience, having to explain why I'm doing what I'm doing and why it is so important to have this data in person, why it's that I am the only one who can interview. So usually when I interview women, I wouldn't let my research assistants interview because I don't think they have the qualification or the experience. I personally do most of them when it is a vulnerable population. Um, so having to explain this in a, for grant purposes, for money purposes, and why it takes so much more time um, and these interviews can go, sometimes they're 45 minutes, sometimes they're two and a half hours, three hours to justify that time of travel and the funding. So, like I said, there's no easy answer, but I think it's important as um, feminist researchers that we stick to the principle and convince everyone or, you know, lure everyone else into our side, if I may use that language, um, rather than giving up on our principles. So it's resilience and, you know, resist the mainstream traditional methods. So I don't know if that was helpful. But. Thank you so much, Menaka. And thank you so much to all our panelists. You know, unfortunately, we do not have any more time to answer the other questions. We are really sorry about that. But at the same time, that's why this is a six part series, because there is so much to unpack. So in closing, there are just a few things um, I want to do. The first is to remind us that um, the, we have a third session coming up on June 4. So please, please keep that, it, keep that in your calendars. Um, so on June 4, that next session is going to focus on uh, migrant women workers' voices and um, telling migration stories. So we'll hear from migrant workers in Ethiopia and Canada who have uh, documented and analyzed their own lives in film and music um, in order to advocate for themselves. So we'll learn about longitudinal ethnographic writings and uh, short analytical work. Um, to look at the complexities of migratory journeys from Asia and Africa to Europe and West um, Asia. So that's on June 4. Um, in terms of our session today, just by way of a really quick wrap up, thank you so much to our speakers who've given us, you know, wealth of experience and expertise here. Um, I think we've all realized the cliche is true, like knowledge is power and who gets to define the problem also has a big influence on what kinds of solutions are therefore prioritized, right? And in the way the problem has been defined historically, women's voices and the voices of marginalized people have been excluded, have been seen as less credible. And that's why FPAR research is super important to center those voices and also to ground it in action, right? Um, and that's what we've seen today. So a few more things. Um, as we've said, this session has been recorded and the first session was also recorded. You can find those recordings um, on the GATW Facebook page. So I'm just gonna share that on our chat now. Um, so this recording will be up, this, this recording will be up shortly as well. Um, sorry, here you go. And also, as Lucina said earlier, we'd like to ask you to please um, fill in a, a survey so we can contact you about interest in doing FBAR or to find out what FBAR work you've been doing already and what spaces there are for collaboration. Um, and so the link to that survey is here. May we please ask you to fill that in after the session or even now? Um, yeah, please uh, make time to fill that out. That, that's quite valuable information for future collab. And finally, just big, big thank you to the co-organizers of this event. Um, there is a collective huge effort behind this. A lot of people have been working behind the scenes. Um, massive thank you to everyone who's attended. Um, and of course, big, big thanks to our interpreters as well for helping us reach a wider audience with this. So um, thanks everyone and see you on June 4th.